morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here for the 22nd annual reading of Women of Words. I know. <laughs> Over these many years, we have called through our own creative works, and we've also created new works based on selected themes. Tonight's program features new and revised works inspired by the theme of gifts, presented by Catherine Drexel, myself, Kate Donahue, Jenny Highland, and Suzanne Marshall. And of course, as poets, we have interpreted this theme both literally and figuratively. Again, thank you for being here, and we hope you enjoy the readings. Good evening, I'm Catherine Drexel, and I'm first up. And if I have my glasses on, I can't see to read the poems. <laughs> the first one is Plymouth, New Hampshire. It isn't just on gravestones the old names remain. Ahern, Rand, Jocks, Mayhew, Pease, layers of families, shifting bridges and buildings. The economy whirls like the ridgetop windmills with mini malls, the university, and pumpkins. Like the steam stream gauge of the penny, who, what, and where rise and fall around each other. Everything old is new again. Once, Plymouth rested beneath a shallow sea. Later, glaciers arranged rocks and mountains attractively. Now farmers plant corn. Leaf peepers seek color. Shoppers seek bargains. While students and teachers call Plymouth home. Town, river, and road cross, curve, and follow like figures in a line dance, in and out of step. People, stone, water, and trees. Winter and summer, the wind blows. Cellars flood. Babies are born. And taxes rise. Roots reach deep even for homeless pianos and old sofas. Ladders recycles the past into possibilities. Not even the names of her financial institutions remain constant. Just the river that ebbs, flows, and overflows until the time when our carbon-stuffed air releases downstate water, and Plymouth will once again rest under a shallow sea. I tend to do a lot of um, editing the day of the performance. <laughs> That's why you see the puzzled looks. The next one is change. Some locations <clears throat> refuse to remain static. Out of glacier-broke mountains, wild winter melt brooks erupt, sweep away leaf detritus. Over runaway weeks of fierce melt, churn and roar, ice-weathered basalt fissures granite. Over seasons, these part-time rivers carve ravines. Rain-wracked edges crumble, scatter talus and scree. Ravaged clefts spring after spring, widen, lengthen, curl. Loose stone dragged round and round opens potholes. Stone shells littered with granite pearls. This is kind of a 
humorous one. I used to work at Head Start, which is a federal program, and um, the idea of having holidays, holy days, is not one of the things that they value. So this is called Simple Gift. This Friday at 4 p.m., our shh, off the clock holiday gathering. Shh, brownies and coffee, glitter and wrap, self-esteem, mutual support, important. Oh no, tomorrow, urgent. I shed my hairnet, sneak away. How can I budget by for four? Not chocolate. Not cut rate cute, but practical. Somehow needful and seasonal. <gasps> wow! Four bargain basket, mini lights, a dollar each, red, blue, silver, green. No fuss, batteries included. Sized for a keychain, tinfoil to wrap. Cheerfully accepted, successful presents, hugs and thank yous all around. Post April's week's vacation, the gifts recap. Four Sunday hikers up Welch Dickey. Late afternoon, turned around. Is this our path? Where is here? Step after step over roots through brush, late and later, headed past twilight. How to keep going in deep night darkness. Four keychain mini lights pulled from pockets, thumbed awake, down the path, the urgent, important, and needful lights. Spread cones of welcome, brightness. Down to parking lot, cars, cell phones, and safety. Um, through the dark. I hate impired, impaired night vision. I know this road, but no longer at night. Houses, street signs, side roads slip in and out of vagueness. I follow the lines and hope. Like a poem slips from image to image without logic. Metaphors gather and compact, unfold like new drapes open to expose their patterns. The creating mind tangles perceptions. Unpack thoughts become hidden artifacts of connection between ideas and images. When I reach the porch lights of my destination, the moments of struggle to arrive are gift. And um, I don't do a lot of going in airplanes. So I spend all my time looking out the window. So this is Journey to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Below us, white clouds, like plow-tumbled snowbanks. Not one landmark interrupts these wind-muddled cascades. I gaze into acres of endless ice-dammed rivers. Clouds like jumbled crockery platters. Unlike Plymouth's roadside piles of March bitten snow, to dare to step out and on to is to precipitate a fall, to drop through insubstantial layers of pale blue cloud mountains. Such slopes impossible to hike or ski. We fly above gray fairy icebergs. Impossible mountains surround us. The heights and depths of these reaches, impossible to map. Thank you very much.
I'm Kate Donahue. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read was inspired by a letter and packages that my grandfather, whose nickname was Stubb, received along with others in his Marine Regiment. It was Christmas time when they were stationed on the Western Front in France during World War I. Christmas packages to Stubb Wall and the boys of the 6th Regiment. The boxes arrive from Holland, Michigan, corrugated cardboard, dented, rough handling of precious goods. To the boys of the 6th for Stubb Wall, the Leathernecks, all scramble to open presents. Stubb's aunt mate remembers, a money belt, pneumatic pillow. Marianne Dupree, a classmate, sends honey, candy, a small cake, homemade. Holland High School remembers the boys, Stubb, Bill, Cobby, and Marsh with handkerchiefs. And WGN, the football coach, sends tobacco, a cribbage set, just in case they find time to play a hand or two in the trenches somewhere in France. Uh, this next poem came to me while I was watching an interpretive dance performance during Advent season at the Episcopal Church of the Holy Spirit. Song of Angels. Choir music lingers. After the processional, harmony folds itself into soft oak pews, passes down the red carpeted aisle, settles along stained glass, and an altar. Mary's hands lift up, up, to receive God's love and care. Fear not rings the angel's song, for unto you a child is born, the Son of God. A gift from heaven, this song of angels. It's always fun to get a bouquet of flowers delivered on your front doorstep, right? When you're not expecting them. Um, this was inspired by a bouquet of flowers delivered to my house for my birthday, which is in April. Emissary to Spring. Spring arrived on my stoop today, carried by daffodils, pink carnations, and flag iris, accented in ferns, and white stasis. One small whiff, the fragrances mixing out from a glass pitcher, and my soul's colors return from winter's freeze and rogue cruise sand. Thank you, flower smiths, for this portent of spring wrapped in tissue paper and cellophane. Many of you may know knitting is a hobby of mine along all the roads traveled and by the fireplace and TV shows and football games. Uh, many people in my life are benefactors of blankets, scarves, and sweaters, inspired by a Peggy Pond Church poem in which she wrote about making bread. I wrote a poem about knitting a blanket and it was first presented to my son Sean's college roommate as a graduation gift. Gift of a hand-knitted blanket. I give you the grasslands far flung for grazing and the meadow swollen in lush green, small streams and hooves clip-clopping along stones. I give you spring and summer warmth, curly fleece rich with scents of lanolin, and the shade's long coolness from the stands of maples lining a stone wall where merino sheep sleep lazily until herded back at twilight, dogs barking at their hind quarters. I give you the shearing shed in early October and dry wood floors, sunset light through windows gauzed in fleecy dust and the used bleats threading the metallic whir of clippers, pulling off thick, woolly coats. 
I give you memories of women holding spindles in one hand, fixing wool in the clefts, fingers on their other hand, drawing strands of carded fleece to whirl, circle, drop, and twist in synchronized rhythms. I give you this cable Afghan pattern, seed stitches and stocking knit stitches, loopy paths of weft and warp, and a tick, tick, ticking, rising softly from my fingers. I give you this blanket, gift of sheep and hands, downy as summer's unmown grass, comforting as your mother's embrace. Working in the fields of Longview Farm for 10 years has been rewarding and inspiring for me. Uh, this poem links my birth family's farming with my learning of my heritage, of my farming life. Inherited gifts. A call of ancestors, relentless, unyielding shadows pushed me forward to the farm, its fields and soil, furrows and crops, and I went. I drove the farm pickup we named Bessie Blue through tilled loam, a rich mix composted from two large zucchinis yanked and flung off the vine, then churned into soft dirt, raised as mounds that stretched east to west, newly fertile land waiting for transplants of squash, cucumbers, beets. I serpentined greenhouse aisles, learned the anatomy of tomatoes, suckered, then clipped onto strings, a blush of ripeness glowed on their round red bodies, dusted in a veneer of yellow pollen. I knelt in deep mud after rain, and in rain coursing along the spines of beans. I rubbed elbows with shadows of uncles, cousins, grandsires, parents, as I picked handfuls of beans curved like green question marks. With the noon sun at my neck, my arms turning brown and rounded as the earth, and my hands rooted into each day, harvesting my legacy, I thanked these gardens that welcomed the ghosts of my heritage with open, furrowed fields. Thank you. I'm Jenny Hyland, and thank you all so much for coming out. Poems mean a whole lot more when you have people to give them to. I kind of got going on the theme this year around Christmas time. It's such a, a powerful story and time of year. So this one's called Nativity. The woman pants, bloody-thighed in the straw, her back pressed against mud wall, toes gripping down to hoof-packed dirt. All her substance, all her history, all her will focused around this white hot burning deep in her belly. It pulses, relentless, searing her from inside, a presence too intimate to be called pain, too vast to be contained. When the fresh stink of birth cuts through the odors of stale urine and manure, and the child floods out into the straw, her eyes squeeze shut for one last push. And afterward, as she rests half-dazed, while tiny lips nuzzle her breast, and her hand halos a damp head, they do not need to tell her what hovers above the thatch, her whole body knows that the afterbirth was a star. And continuing on that theme, the next poem is named for a very famous gift. It's called Myrrh. And a little background on some of the, um, at least a, a commonly accepted symbolism for the, the gifts of the wise men was that gold represented royalty 
frankincense, which was um, often burned in the temples, was for divinity. And then myrrh, which was also used as a balm for the dead, represented mortality. But this poem also actually turned out to be about something that I, th I think happens with all babies um, and mothers too. When I think all new mothers uh, go through a change when they suddenly realize that something they love so deeply is mortal. And also when, when I was doing my residency and would start the mornings in the nursery, which was wonderful, um, we'd see babies anywhere from an hour or two old to a week or two old. And the change was just so remarkable. I mean, within the first 24 hours, they went from seeming like they belonged from, to another planet <laughs> to really coming into the earth. So this is called myrrh. She cannot stop tasting it, bitter above all, pine tar and loam. One lick of a resin-stained finger, and now the taste will not leave her tongue. It burrows into her body, spreading through her neck, her chest. It tinctures the milk pooled within her breasts, and she feels the baby startle, yet keep on sucking. And she knows the child has felt it too, the shock of the heart being entered by earth. Pungent ache of gravity, the rich crumble of decay eddying within each vaulted chamber, a dark stream folded into the blood. Redolence of soil radiates through arteries, infuses the infant's limbs, bowels, it permeates the skin from underneath and travels down each nerve until she sees the mortal essence deep in his eyes. And she knows that though something has been lost, the child has been strangely enriched. Heaven will never be simple again, and he needs her now like he needs every vital dying thing. Sometimes a piece of good advice can be a tremendous gift. And I actually received this unexpected piece of advice from Jonathan Santor a number of years ago. This is called Advice from the Composer. It is not enough to listen, to constantly collect notes, tones. You must watch just as avidly until you can link every sound with its maker. You must see as well as hear how a chord is built before you can transfer it confidently to paper. Learn to recognize clarinet paired with English horn, cornet melting into saxophone, boy soprano backed by six young women. Train your ears to distinguish the timbre of A string from E string. Read flute from ocarina from white throated sparrow, south wind from north. So that when the music comes, drop by drop, or flooding into your invisible ear, you will be able to find a mortal voice to bring each sound out into the common air. I think oftentimes the greatest gifts we've been given are the ones we're kind of oblivious to. This is called sword play. Pirate queens, Narnian wars, Robin Hood and her merry band, the storyline didn't matter much as long as we got to slide swords from scabbards, hack the air with mighty blades and deliver bone-crushing blows, or better yet, faint and dance, all wrist flick and elbow, armed with delicate, deadly rapier. We'd thrust, parry, dodge and whirl, leaping from couch to easy chair, or if weather permitted, skirmish among the azaleas. Losing was at least as good as winning, 
It meant agony and death, which we milked to the hilt. <laughs> Staggering with one hand clutched to the wound, sword hand still valiantly flailing. We'd groan and pant and topple down embankments or slide head first down the stairs. Before our blood had cooled, we'd bounce up and rejoin the fray, anxious either to slay or improve on our performance. With flourish and gasp, we'd bite the dust all afternoon, while across town, the black boys got to do it only once. The rest will be cheerful, I promise. <laughs> Daylight saving. Actually, this year, for the first time, I was one of those people who totally forgot to spring forward. I always wondered how that could happen, but it happened. <laughs> Daylight saving. <clears throat> Blindsided this March by forward in the not yet spring. 20 inches of snowpack on the ball fields, garden in deep freeze, and out of the question to enjoy a beer on the deck in the newly light evening hour. Mm -hmm. For what exactly have I been bounced back to pitch black when the alarm goes off, to scraping my windshield in the pre-dawn just when I thought we were getting somewhere? <laughs> Two weeks from now, I'll have made my peace with this legislated jet lag. <laughs> and come May, when the 5 a.m. sky is pale as apple blossoms, I'll be planting broccoli after dinner. June means all day hikes without pressure of darkness. And in July, we'll picnic by the lake after work, an evening swim and a bask on the rocks before sunset. I'll forget all about that lost stolen hour plucked from my life back in spring. Won't wonder where it is stashed, tucked away in some cosmic vault. Not until fall, when the night edges in at both ends of the day, will I suddenly remember that lost, shining hour, perfectly preserved, round and golden as a coin, as a sun, and that lovely autumn night when it will be slipped under my pillow and given back. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, I couldn't have planned this better. I hope your noses enjoy the parking lot on your way out today. This is called Quintessence. In apple blossom season, I live only to inhale that most fragile of scents, cool and delicate, like the rarest form of happiness, caught on the wind across field or fence, soap bubble of a smell, gone by the next in-breath. I pant on tiptoes beneath branches, trying to reel that sweetness in, in apple blossom season. Every exhalation is a sigh. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Sunday was Mother's Day, and our first gift, life itself, came from our mothers. And they have given us many things, though sometimes it takes a lifetime for us to realize it and to acknowledge it. So this is what she gave me. My square jaw, my stick, straight hair, two sisters, two cats, a red-tailed hawk with a broken wing, family dinner, six o'clock at the kitchen table. Stop fidgeting, eat your peas. My mouth washed out with ivory soap. Bedside lamp, a spinning cylinder inside, flickering red-yellow, red-yellow a forest fire. List of chores, weed the strawberries, wash the pots, press dad's cotton handkerchiefs. Grimm's 
fairy tales. Rapunzel trapped in a tower, her golden braid hanging like a rope. No penny loafers. Buster Brown Oxfords, laces and orthopedic inserts. Box of paints, watercolor paper. At graduation, a suitcase and a pack on the cheek. Her mother's pearls for my wedding day. Dried soup beans and dill. Tupperware assorted sizes. Spit, spunk, make it on your own. Brittle bones, stubborn will. <laughs> Even with the best intentions, some gifts tend to go awry. This is the Jays. It began as a kindness. Nights and days well below freezing, snow covering the ground. Before breakfast, I'd lay a handful of peanuts on my deck. I remembered my mother scattering nuts and seeds, calling the jays. And they came. At first, only one. A flash of blue, he stood before my offering in crested hat, suit edged in white, a neat black collar at his throat. Cocking his head, he picked up the nut in his beak and flew away. Word spread. <laughs> By the end of the week, a mob of jays, all bravado and strut, descends on the meager feast with wild squawks, scolding, and hawk imitations meant to intimidate. They swagger and brawl, flap their wings, peck and shove at each other, grab what they can get. Chickadees, banished to the oaks, witness the fray, as I do from my window. One last raucous squawk, and they're off. Only feathers and broken shells left behind. We all know, everybody in this room, know the long, cold winters, especially this past one. Um, each year when the snow is the deepest and the temperatures are the coldest, a gift appears. The seed catalog. <laughs> arrives by mail, brown paper wrapped, my garden snow covered four feet deep. Hungry, I thumb through its pages, whisper the names of flowers, names to warm me, blanket flower, foxglove, lamb's ears, Names on fire, sparks will fly, red hot poker, torch lily. Others to kindle desire. <laughs> Kiss me over the garden gate, love in a puff, scarlet O'Hara morning glory. Names that sizzle and pop, Santa Fe sunflower, snapdragon, poppy and ones to shake my winter stupor. Johnny jump up, devil's trumpet, bugle weed. Names like seeds, bulbs, hold promise. Suzanne means lily. Dreaming beneath the snow, hardy, late to bloom. We might wish upon a falling star, but perhaps the best gifts are already here on Earth. <coughs> Meteorite. Number one, holding hands beneath an old bed quilt, they tilt back in lawn chairs, watch shards of light streak the night sky. A fireball flares, hissing, spitting, red and gold sparks. A trail of glitter behind touches earth. 
too. Within a ceremonial kiva, a star stone, smooth and black as night, silver tinged, wrapped in sage and feather robe, a winged creature that can no longer fly. Three, an unearthly chime his hull rings against rock, half buried in loam, pushed up by spring frost. The man levers it up, tugs it from the ground, and eyeing its size, its heft, its charred surface mottled with strange indents, he lugs it home to show his wife. She sets it on the kitchen floor, props the door open, lets in a warm breeze, and lilacs. Four, dark pebble in desert sand, its ancient feel old as the sun. She binds it with a silver chain to wear at her throat. Five, the gods have been known to descend to earth. A flash of fire, then dark flight, their bright light hidden beneath cap and muslin shirt to touch a woman's hand, the pulse at her throat, to smell lilacs, sage, they choose earth. Sometimes in loss we learn to treasure the gifts that remain and in them to find some comfort. Thanksgiving for Susan 1943 to 2017. November rain clouds roll back, edges gold stained with dying light, pale blue beyond. Dry beech leaves, parchment thin, refuse to fall, shimmy on a sudden breeze. A loon then only a ripple. Beneath the cold surface, she dives into the lake's heart. Mourners gather on the shore. Behind us, in the mist-shrouded marsh, Winterberry offers red fruit. Over a lifetime, we're given several opportunities to recreate ourselves. For me, it was leaving home, going off to college, teaching, um, staying home to raise a child, now retirement. For all of my Tai Chi friends who are here, every time we do a slow set, we have that same opportunity to recreate ourselves. Origami refolded. Given a square of washi paper, mine textured, stained earth shades and ash, I line up the edges, press sharp folds on a hard surface, Rotate, reverse, turn over, under, over years, into mountains, valleys, crevices, unseen ravines. My paper worn, wrinkled, torn along deep seams, edges softened. I unfold, 
smooth the creases, light feathers through. I begin again, a simpler shape, paper wings, flight aligned with the vast dark universe, ever folding, unfolding. For a poet, the greatest gift other than a sharp pencil with a good eraser <laughs> is a listener. And without you, all of you, we would be one hand clapping in the dark. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us tonight and for being good listeners. So we will give you a two hand applause. <laughs> It's clapping. <laughs> and we also want to thank Pease Library for providing this lovely, it feels like a living room. And we've invited friends in to just do a poetry reading together. So it has a very nice feel to it. Um, we thank Pease. We thank the Drexel boys, <laughs> Joe and Peter, for filming us. And um, please come up and say hello. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And we'd ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you're writers too, we'd love to hear what you're writing. Um, if you're interested in a chat book, um, we have a chat book for sale over there. Um, but thank you again for coming.